I'm going to introduce you to John Buckingham from Sandwich Bay Burns Urge now to talk about the waders that we have on the East Coast Coast. Morning everyone, just wait for you all to, uh, to come in. So yes, it's my job uh, this morning to tell you something about the, the birds now and the requirements that birds have around our local coastline. Um, I'm from Sandwich Bay Bird Observatory and it's our job to monitor uh, the bird life around past the East Kent coast. Uh, we have a recording area which runs basically from Deal south uh, round into Pegwell Bay much closer up to what you hear. Uh, but of course we don't monitor the whole area that we're really talking about until today. So the birds we're going to look at today um, are called waders. Uh, we're only going to look at six or seven species. But although they may look very similar, they all have different requirements. And all of them, every single bird that you'll see today, requires uh, to move around with the tides. We at least, I think, appreciate the fact that tides come in and out this happens twice a day and it doesn't happen with the clock it happens on a changing basis as the, uh, the time comes in and out and some of these birds uh, all of these birds need to feed at night time as well as during the day and certainly for birds that are here during the winter as many of these birds are uh, they come down from arctic areas to enjoy our warmer climate and reasonably warm conditions around our coastline need to go out and feed at low tide continuously. Sometimes it feeds during the day, sometimes at night time. When they're not feeding, uh, these birds need to rest up and roost. They're using a lot of energy um, running around over mud flats and sand flats, perhaps avoiding people along the, uh, along the beach. And that's really the sort of thing that we're talking about uh, today. But I really want to talk to you about the birds' perspective and what the birds need to take out of our environment based along what else we, uh, we're looking at. So we've got a series of, uh, of birds, and what I've done is to place the birds uh, within, in my photographs here, within the habitat in which we, we find them. So the first one you're seeing here is a bird I'm going to come back to later on, it's a bird called a turnstone. And I think it features heavily in the work that, uh, that you do, and everyone out there who's out in the field here does in talking about birds, because turnstones uh, tend to feed higher up on the beaches. Some of the other birds will follow the tide down of the mud flats and sand flats to sea. So what I'm really showing here is that turnstones will feed in amongst the rocks, the rock platform, in amongst the seaweeds and the algae that we find on the top of the beach. All of the birds will be taking invertebrates from their environment, bivalves, or range of things like snails and so on. But actually out on the flats, the flats themselves, the tide will have come in, it will have deposited new food on the, on the mud, it will have replenished it. So tides are important for birds, and particularly those that we see during the, uh, during the winter months. Uh, so I'm going to come back to turnstones, and anyway, if, if any of you live locally, you'll recognise all the views. I'm not going to mention exactly where we, we are, but this is a varied coastline that we, we are looking at. So part of our monitoring at Sandwich Bay, as I said, uh, covers only up to a limited part of the whole of the East Kent coast. However, we do help in the monitoring of waders at once a year, winter waders around the entire coastline of East Kent. And I'm one of the people who goes out and does counts. And this is the area of my count of Westgate Bay. Um, sometimes on cold days, sometimes on calm days. Some, always on a high tide, with the birds roosting. Uh, and that's quite important because as you can see here, on a windy day with the wind behind the tide, it's not just blowing up it's coming up on the beach, it's blowing up over the promenade and the sort of places uh, where some of the birds might be, might be roosting. Uh, so where do they go? Well, uh, they'll have pretty standard places, they'll certainly understand the tides, but uh, you'll find when you start to learn about birds is uh, that they're great creatures of, of habit. It's very difficult for them to make decisions and to move off, move on and find new, new places. Uh, so here's a situation where I saw very few birds that day, but if you walk to the far end of Westgate Bay there, um, the, the, the footpath runs out completely. And happily, that means that not so many people walk right down to the end there. And consequently, it was a pretty quiet day, but it was pretty good. And there were waiters like turnstones and red shanks, two species we'll look at in a moment, that actually roost up on the, on the 
Here on another day, um, it was calm, it wasn't a full high tide, and you can see that at the high tide, uh, there's still some beach, some seaweed down there, possibly a few rocks left for the birds to, to roost on, uh, where they're quite well camouflaged against that environment. Um, so, uh, the only bird I saw on that day, however, that I can see here is a pinprick uh, on the end of the, uh, the uh, slipway there, and that's a uh, tennyson looked at, and it was sitting there uh, undisturbed, it would sit there uh, for the rest of the high tide, resting up, not using any energy, and then fly off. But in a situation like this, uh, where the coastline isn't so natural, then that turnstone didn't have too much opportunity. Another place it might have sat, might have been on the beach underneath the, 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 the promenade here. But uh, birds are aware of changes in the, in the tide. So we've looked at a few figures today, you won't see too much, many facts coming up on you, I'm going to relate the facts to you. Um, 4.9 million waders uh, winter in Britain every year, and those birds come down from Arctic areas. This is a, a rather nicely projected map, because you can actually see the roundness of the globe there, and uh, you can see the Arctic Circle very clearly, and you can actually see our position not only against Europe, but also against Greenland and Iceland, and the uh, the northern states and Canada. And it's in those northern Arctic areas that the majority of these birds actually uh, come from to share their, their winter months with, uh, with us. Um, during a part of this winter bird population, uh, of six of those species, ten um, of them have declined, six of them have declined over the last ten years. I'll talk about declines of birds, but in monitoring birds continuously as we do, we're able to come up with huge numbers of uh, amounts of that these days, and probably the bird that is uh, under most threat, uh, certainly the birds we're going to look at today, is a bird called the curlew, uh, which you'll see a photograph of, but I think most of you might know curlew, so big brown waders with long legs and long bills probing into the, into the mud. Um, it's, it's actually a globally threatened species, not just threatened here, and I mean 25,000 of them a winter with, uh, with us. The point is that this is 25% population of Europe, so that's actually an important part of the European um, population of just that one species. Often we can see waders in large numbers, um, certainly not in the numbers you can see here immediately around the Thanet coast, but along the North Kent coast uh, in the, uh, in the estuary, uh, estuaries around the uh, north coast of Kent uh, and into the Swale. Uh, birds like this, these are birds called Dunlins now, um, will actually at high tide sit together Quietly like this. So a disturbance there would actually uh, affect several hundred uh, birds. They really do need to, uh, to rest up once they've been feeding. Um, it's no good just burning all the energy off that uh, uh, they've been taking from their food supply and some of that uh, once they're there. So these are things that are worth uh, considering. They recognise the time when the tide is going out because on cold days it's even more critical to uh, go and find their food. So from a roost like one you just looked at of Dunlins, <coughs> this is a roost of birds called knot, uh, birds that come from the uh, far north of Greenland and up in Canada, long distances, uh, travel to, uh, to come to us for the winter. All of the birds are actually quite strong flyers, and obviously from the map that I just showed you, it uh, means that they can cover really long distances on their migration journeys. Um, however, uh, it also means that they really need to stock up with food. So as we go through each species separately now, um, hopefully what you will see is that each of those species, although they have great similarities, are using different parts of the environment to find their food, but possibly uh, joining each other uh, in the same roosting environment. So I've talked about winter birds, but we can see waders around our coastline all year round, and a few of them attempt to breed with us along this coastline. And by breeding, that means finding somewhere where they can put their eggs on the ground, because these birds don't nest in trees. Somewhere close to the, uh, to the water, and all of these birds have got long or longish legs, which means they can feed along the tide line in soft mud and so on. But starting from our position at Sandwich Bay, we're actually looking north here, up the Sandwich Bay beach. That's a Pegwall Bay beyond, and then you can see the chalk cliffs there of Thanet up to the north, and that's Ramsgate across to the right hand 
inside there. So the limits of our monitoring range take us up into Pegor Bay. It's the corner that goes up in the left of the back of the picture. And we're looking at a bird called a ringed plover now. Hmm. This is one of only uh, a couple of the species we're looking at that actually attempts to breed anywhere around here. And those birds that breed have got even more problems uh, with disturbance along these beaches than, than any others. Um, human beings are fairly predictable in the way that we move around in the environment, and sometimes I'm really surprised at uh, how well birds actually cope with our presence. And for the uh, 10, 11, 12 years that I've been at Sandwich Bay Bird Observatory, um, birds like ring plovers have managed to live alongside us along the beach. But of course our requirements are that more of us uh, might need to use these features we play on for years for our uh, life cycles and our well our well being. Um, so that disturbance will, will continue. Uh, but we then got to wonder what will happen to ring clubs, because certainly last year on our entire stretch of coastline in Sandwich Bay, I think we found only two pairs of breeding uh, ring clubs. The next thing that's popped up on the screen, and this will come up, I won't explain it every time, uh, for each of these species, is the conservation status that has been based on all of these birds, taking into account all sorts of factors, uh, where they come from, whether they come from long distances, whether they're globally threatened or not, whether they're threatened in Europe or not. And if they're threatened in this country, if you can hear me, I'm just wondering a bit, let's get closer, sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, and in this country, um, they've given a, a BOCC status, a Birds of Conservation Concern. And there are three coloured limits that they're placed in. And those birds showing us most concern are placed on the red list. Uh, this is birds that are really quite endangered. There's then an amber list, where the uh, danger might be moderate to them, to their survival. Or the green list, well, I can tell you that of the, I think it's seven species or eight species, See, they're all either on red or amber. Yes. So, uh, these birds are all very vulnerable. You can see the eggs, hopefully, in that uh, photograph there. Yeah. Um, the birds in this place appears on the bottom line. The second bird that uh, will attempt to breed, uh, and over recent years less successfully because I haven't seen a, an oyster catcher yes, for some time now, is this species. Despite the fact that it's a long walk um, from Sandwich and out and up to the Point of Sandwich Bay where it reaches the Pegwell Bay. But perhaps one or two breed in Pegwell. The oyster catch is a big black and white wader with an, a large red beak. And uh, these birds will actually feed out on mudflats at times and they feed on bivalves. And uh, some fans to the side now, we've got some detail on a young uh, oyster catcher feeding out on the mudflats and um, uh, picking this bivalve up. This is a cockle. Uh, they have bills that uh, are adapted to feed in different ways. And one oyster catcher will have a bill that enables it to actually move, push its bill into the side of the five out, and prise them open to get to the prize inside. You can see the bird's just done that, hopefully, because the seawater is running out of the shell. Others are actually able to deal with shells in another way, and that is to hammer them open. Uh, sometimes over them right up. So even with them in one species, <coughs> we have uh, two different methods of, uh, of feeding, particularly on this type of, uh, of food. So oyster catchers do attempt to breed on our uh, on our coastline. Uh, sorry. Uh, breed on this our coastline here. Uh, however, they also breed inland. They breed in the uplands of Britain, and actually it's a bird that's doing sort of fairly well compared to some of the others. Curlews come to us, and this is a big brown wader with long down curved bill um, that comes purely as a winter visitor. We sometimes also see them as what's known as passage migrants. Uh, they might be breeding up in Scandinavia, they'll move south to spend the winter further south in Europe, just stopping up with, off with us along our coastline here uh, briefly. Um, but as you can see here, I've put this in against uh, 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 past the beach where the tide is uh, rising. In fact, on my slide, I actually faded the birds into the environment, but uh, that's fine. You can see the bird in its environment there. Um, they feed it right out on mudflats themselves. These birds will follow the tides. Uh, so you might not see these feeding so much on the Thanet coast here with the cliffs, uh, but you might, you will see them feeding in Pegwell Bay 
on the long uh, coast of North Kent, where they can get out on the mud flats at low tide. And their food supply, this is another uh, uh, POCC red species, incidentally, as I described earlier on, uh, their time will be spent right out on the mud flats where they actually probe for their food, which they cannot see. They might see some evidence of the ragworms and lugworms that are underneath the mud, but they won't know exactly uh, necessarily where to place their bill. So all of these waders that probe for food are sensitive, you might nerve endings in pits on the tip of the bill, and they're able to feel for their, their locate their food, which they can't see. They're actually aware, not just of touching something, but the movements of these animals as they move around underneath the mud. So ragworms and lugworms are a major source of food for curlews, uh, and really the disturbance involved here isn't just people. People rarely walk out on uh, mudflats and sandflats, but these can be sort of fairly dangerous places uh, for us. Um, however, bait diggers do go out to dig up the ragworms and lugworms <coughs> for their own use or perhaps to sell. And also these days we're seeing windsurfing around uh, Pegwell Bay. So birds are being affected now uh, by all the sorts of extra things that we may probably wish to do for our own well-being. Red shanks too, nice easy one to remember this one. I think most of these have been fairly distinctive birds to identify. Um, it's a bird with bright orange red legs and a, and a reddish bill. And they also feed around the edges of the uh, coasts, but particularly around on salt marshes. Uh, these are areas where the tide is not so strong and um, specialised plant species are able to grow uh, and able to withstand uh, the sea water, the salt water that comes over them uh, every day and establish themselves. And as this goes on, more and more plant species are added to that list and eventually the level of land that this salt marsh will, that salt marshes will build up. And these are the sort of places where we find the, uh, the red shanks. Uh, we're talking in uh, about an hour species here, so not so critical as the ones that we, uh, we've already mentioned. And red shanks we can see um, around us all year round. They probably travel shorter distances than some of the other waders when it comes to migration. And uh, the map here is a map published by the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology, at the observatories around the country. We, always work, work, we all work uh, with the BTO. Uh, with our monitoring, and this quite simply shows not the exact track, but where uh, the blue circle up in Iceland there uh, is where a bird was ringed. I'm one of the ringers at Sandwich Bay Bird Observatory, and green there at Sandwich Bay where we took it out of the net. So we've got an awful lot of information comes through bird ringing, but that's a, an enormous subject. Lapwings uh, are birds perhaps we all recognise. We might call them green plovers, we might call them peewits. And these birds breed all over the country in suitable habitats, usually on freshwater wetlands. But they will come to the coast to find places to roost uh, when they're unable to, to, to feed. And salt marshes, as I've just described, are important places. So if you stood at Pigwell Bay and looked out across the salt marshes there, uh, they can roost in amongst those pretty well camouflaged. There's a better view of them that in there than they would um, elsewhere. So we're back at Thanet now, and uh, uh, the promenades running underneath these wonderful chalk cliffs and those fabulous sandy beaches, which are so good for us and so good for birds. Um, a long time ago now, um, I was brought down age four for my holidays every year from that point onwards to Westgate, which is where I do my bird camps in the winter. So that's rather nice to, uh, to come back. Uh, but here we can see that the beaches, it slopes very shallowly here. Uh, but the tide, and therefore the tide goes right out. And the little birds, the little whitish birds that I put in here, are birds called sandlings. Now, it doesn't matter too much about the differences in identifying these birds. Uh, that's not really your job to worry about that. However, what I'm trying to show you today is that they all feed in different ways and in different places. So everywhere can be vulnerable. So sandlings uh, come for the winter and they feed along the tide line. They will actually move in and out with the, with the tide. They feed on little worms, um, called nerian worms, that exist only where the sand is wet <laughs> when the birds can penetrate. So as the, as the tide goes out, the beach dries off, so the sandlings then need to keep pace with their, 
food supply. So that can take us quite a long way from us when the tide goes out. However, they also feed uh, on tiny little invertebrates, sorry, shrimps, that uh, live in the back. Uh, the, 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 when, when the sea breaks in, it then swells back out again and they feed in these conditions. Very occasionally, when the tide is in, this is an amber uh, listed bird uh, here, they come from a long way away in Arctic Canada. They will feed up on the top of the beach when the tide is in high and they'll probe into the, uh, the loose sand. This sort of evidence will show you, if you look closely enough, at the sand on the top of the beach where the birds probe with their bills so you can see the marks of their feet as they're, as they're moving around. They'll also search underneath the seaweed that's been left on the top of the beach for various invertebrates, flies, sand hoppers and uh, so on. And they will often feed along with turnstones. The turnstones I've already described feed along the top of the beach in the, uh, in the rocky areas as you can see here. And this is a really good example now. We can talk about all of these birds being camouflaged, but this is a really good one. When you look at the back of that turnstone, this one is actually in breeding plume, still here. They don't breed in, uh, in Britain, and how well camouflaged they are amongst the rocks and particularly the seaweed. So turnstones do turn over stones uh, to look for their food underneath, um, but they also uh, move the seaweed about to find sand hoppers. There is plenty of food available for the birds. But do they have the time to, uh, to, to take that food? Another amber listed bird, as far as the British population is concerned. They will equally be seen with a bird that you can see in the middle of the picture here, and that's a, a bird called a purple sandpiper. Uh, they come from not so far away in the, in the Arctic. They look a bit different to the turnstones. The turnstones against the sea there are rather standing out. <laughs> they prefer to be amongst the rocks. Uh, that's the reverse of the uh, purple sandpipers who feed in amongst bare rocks. Um, we don't see so many of those actually around there, but our coastline and some of the others. But here's one roosting on the sand amongst some of the debris on the top of the beach. Most of those that come to us will come from an archipelago called Svalbard, which is situated right up in the Arctic Circle in the north of Norway. So another map, it's just important to look at a couple of maps with some of these. Um, we're now on a species called the knot. Knots are slightly bigger waders than the, the uh, sandlings, about the same size as the turnstones. And the map is full of arrows, and the arrows indicate their migration routes. The orange ones uh, showing uh, <coughs> knot uh, moving from their breeding grounds, or perhaps their breeding grounds uh, in Siberia, along the coast, down through uh, Russia and Norway. And this is one of the species which we can see as a passage migrant. They, they're only here for a short time. However, we see them as a species as winter visitors as well. But think of the huge journey that these birds have made right out from Canada there, from the extreme northwest of, uh, of Greenland. It's such a long distance that they need to stop off in Iceland as a staging point on the way through. Again, these birds feed out on the mudflats where they're feeding on tiny little bivalves called tenons, a particular species called the Baltic tenon, which is small enough for them to, to deal with. Um, some of the birds also feed on snails. Some of this food they'll actually almost swallow whole, and they produce pellets of the hard, indigestible material, um, rather than it passing down through their digestive system. Now, I mentioned ringing earlier on, and each of the blue dots that you can see on the map there indicates a, a ring, a turn, uh, sorry, a knot that's been ringed in Britain. And the situation is where those birds have actually been found. So in other words, we've got evidence of these uh, migration routes, that's much more than you see on the map. Unlike the other birds that feed perhaps in just small numbers or groups or individually, knots will feed in big flocks. So they require quite a lot of space out on the mudflats and also when they come to, to roost. Knots look very different as some of the other waders do in the summer. When they're breeding in Greenland, they take on a very different appearance, which enables them to blend in with their Arctic surroundings, the tundra. I'm throwing lots of names at you. This is a bird called a dunlin, perhaps a bit smaller than a starling. Uh, a wader that uh, breeds in Scandinavia, but also these birds breed perhaps in the UK, as curlews do, up on high moorland areas, but particularly in blanket bog areas where the are extremely wet, very suitable for waders. But interestingly, when they're up on the moors, or other birds that are up in the tundra, 
uh, will be feeding on completely different sources of food to those they find around here on our coast in winter. And they'll be taking advantage of the huge flight of uh, flies, midges and so on that we're all aware of you know, up to Scotland or to Scandinavia on our summer, summer holidays. But in breeding plumage there, it's, it fits into its surroundings. It's very difficult to see against the cotton grass in which it breeds. It's a red-listed species. In winter, they look very different. They're grey or a brownish colour on the back sometimes, and they'll blend in with the mud and with the sea around them. So we learn a lot from ringing birds. There are big projects going on on all of these species throughout the uh, country. With larger waders like this uh, black-tailed gobwit, um, we can put rings on them that can actually, the numbers and the combinations of colours on those can be read through binoculars when bird watchers are out and, uh, and telescopes, and this can be useful to tell us a lot about the birds and where they come from, too. And this is my last slide. A uh, bird called an Avocet, and of all the birds that we looked at so far uh, that survive in big numbers with us in the, uh, in the winter, but they, they are birds we need to be concerned about. The Avocet is doing really well. This is a huge success story. Uh, a bird that breeds mostly in fresh water or a mix of fresh and salt water environments, but they'll often be associated with the coast, and I'll just leave you with the fact that Avocets, despite everything, have been doing well. We can see them in our area. Get on time. Yeah. Has anyone got any questions for John? Right over the back, Jasmine, please. You can shout it out if you want, so you've got a little bit. Oh, it's not smart. Oh, there we go. Hello. James, hello. Um, right. Uh, I've got like two, if that's all right. Uh, free actually. Um, <laughs> right, is that uh, finished on time? Maybe. Um, which call? Uh, so, uh, do you know of any birds that prim primarily predate on crabs? Uh, not primarily, but they'll turn the centre with eats more crabs, without doubt, but uh, not on, on crabs, just crabs. Around the world there might be. There is actually a species called the crab plover. But it won't just feed totally on crabs, but they're adapted to feed on crabs because they've actually got quite large bills and can deal with But they're found around the Indian Ocean. Uh, also, my second question was um, you know how birds migrate to one north to the south and, like, every year later when they go back up to the north? Yeah. Why don't they just stay in the south? Like, right. They have to, like, go back and forth every year. Birds are, birds are very dynamic and uh, they're, they're capable of movement. Birds can fly uh, and they take advantage of that and they can move from areas where they're not going to feel comfortable, where they're not going to find food uh, during the summer, and they can move up and take advantage of food in the Arctic. Um, if they didn't, we wouldn't find any Arctic wildlife. Um, different types of birds are able to do that. Um, passerines are tiny birds, sort of birds we see in woodlands and our gardens, and they're also called perching birds. But as you go further north, in towards the Arctic, you see, a few, you see fewer passerines. However, birds like wildfowl, waders, ducks, geese and swans and so on, can actually take advantage of the Arctic for just a short period of time. And that's what they're doing. They're taking advantage of this sudden hatch of uh, flies and other invertebrates that the Arctic provides. And as years go on, that's going to provide even more food for them. And some of these birds are going to be breeding even further as they do so. Well, one last question. Um, sorry, I know I'm hugging it. Uh, what would you say, in your opinion, is the strongest flyer out of all the birds in Britain? Sorry, the... What bird can fly has is the best flyer, like, has the strongest wings? Which is the strongest of all flying birds, yeah, but it depends what they're doing. Um, the peregrine, which is a, a falcon, a bird of prey, it has been recorded as flying faster than any other species. But whether its wings will take it over long distances is another matter. And generally when we're looking at migrants and comparing whether species migrates or not. Um, the length of the bird's wing is important in its flight structure. And also to fly long distances, the birds need to carry fuel. And they also have, need to have the ability to carry fuel, which they carry in the form of fat, which they, 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 uh, they store subcutaneously under the skin. And as ringers, we look for this when we're looking at birds, see what condition they're in, particularly um, 
migration time, and we can see the fat as a bright yellow substance, and we can give that fat uh, a score. If all of our fat shows as bright yellow, less of us would be over overweight. I've got one more if that's all right. Do you think that seagulls would evolve differently if uh, humans didn't litter as much? Would they get, if, if, if human beings didn't litter as much? Litter as much? Yeah, well, oh, oh, yes, without doubt. Yes, yes, they've, they've learned to live alongside us. Some birds are more adaptable than others. Um, you'll, you'll call them seagulls, but there are a whole range of different species and they actually all have different requirements. But it's the herring gulls that, see, that, uh, that usually uh, appear to attack us, steal our chips and sandwiches and, uh, and so on. But without that, um, this is actually a species on the, on the, I think they're still on the amber list, not far from the red list in Britain, which means they're actually in, 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 in quite serious danger. But we wouldn't think so because of the numbers that live close to us. All right, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that. Well, they're great questions. Sorry, Jasmine, do you want to come on? Hi, Jasmine. Hi, first of all, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm from the sunny realm of Norfolk. I'm really interested to know is climate change uh, having any impact in terms of some of these populations moving around the coast? Particularly as we're very aware in Norfolk that sea water is rising, uh, it may be salinating some of our fresh water and changing obviously that habitat. So, how are birds responding to that? We, we, we're definitely seeing this, perhaps not so much yet with birds like waders. Um, I, I, I don't think we're, climate change is giving us too much information regarding the birds that we're looking at today. But I can, thinking of you in Norfolk, uh, and I think you've recorded more birds in Norfolk than we've recorded in Kent, which takes something. But anyway, I'll give you that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to somebody's pasture. Um, a bird that used to breed here in Kent, in woodlands, in enormous numbers, is a bird, bird called the willow warbler. Uh, willow warblers are declining now, and you're probably seeing that as breeding birds in Norfolk as well. And they're moving north. Um, studies have been done on willow warblers, and it's been discovered that they will not breed in areas with a temperature over a certain level and consequently their range is moving north and they're moving up towards the Arctic. But another species called the Chiff Chaff, which is a very similar species, um, is a, a, a more subtly breeding species and is moving up with climate change. Is that okay? I couldn't really yeah. answer that quite so well on waiters. I've got time for one more. Okay, I'll have So we're seeing like sea exams as well we're our uh, Winter and water population are crashing every year, and there's a decline very, very fast. And with that data set, why are their numbers increasing, or is that what's happening? Yes. And yes. Why, why do you think so? Right. So, if I can say that, um, that with the BTO, all, all the fit facts and figures you'll see in our atlases include Ireland as well. So, we look at a whole picture. Although your picture of climate and so on is very different to, to ours, I would imagine you're seeing avocets over there. I'm not, I'm not no. sure you're not seeing avocets at all. Very, very this is a species that has uh, historically bred throughout Europe, but only in scattered colonies. You'll never see that lovely bird in, 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 in any habitat. It's got to be particular. Usually, they like semi saline lagoons, lagoons, a mixture between salt and fresh water, which they're finding usually low lying coastal. So that's what attracts them, um, and uh, it's a bird that uh, is somehow or another doing well. Um, it's a bird that became extinct in the UK um, in the early part of the 20th century, but made a comeback along the East Coast. And it's interesting how <coughs> several birds that also breed with avocets, including black-headed gulls, Mediterranean gulls, other birds of wetlands, are some of the first species to move back into the UK. But also, in the time after the Second World War, when avocets first came back, there's been an awful lot more protection of wildlife, creation of nature reserves and so on, for specialised birds like that. Yeah, we've seen the same thing with the great sort of woodpecker and everything. Yes. It's been provoked two or three hundred years. Yes. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a brilliant example. Yeah. Um, um, if, you, if you look at even fairly recent maps, um, it shows great spotted woodpeckers. Yeah. as being here in, uh, on our side of the Irish Sea and absolutely not on yours. 
And it wasn't until um, I, 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 I had lots of clients who had lived all over the place, and one from Ireland said, I've got a great spot in my picture in my garden. That was the first I'd heard, and that was one of the first that had been seen. Because they are not migrants. No, I mean, just say a bit more. Yeah. But they're not migrants, they've got short brown wings. These are birds that are sedentary, they live in woodlands. Uh, and are not known to migrate. The woodpeckers are not great migrants. Yeah. So to get across to Ireland was quite a thing, and the Irish Sea was a barrier for them. Yeah. Well, there we are. Yeah. They'll now go across the stage, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Thank you.